Turn with me, book of Genesis, chapter 4, verse 16 to 26. We're going to read book of Genesis, chapter 4, verse 16 to 26. We're going to hear God's word all together. Here's the word of God. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mahujael, and Mahujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Adah, and the name of the other Zillah. Adah bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock, His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal-Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal-Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son, and called his name Seth, for she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. Uh, Last Sunday we talked about the power of ordinary. Um, If you compare the trends of this world, um, we need to really uh, get to know how important it is to uh, enjoy what God has given us in our ordinary because um, this world is trying to make us fix our eyes on only visible reality. Um... And that's the Satan's scheme. He has already set up the trends of this world, which means values or standards of this world. And uh, it has become culture, like streams, waves. Because Satan wants us to get rid of God in our thoughts, in our minds, in our lives. So... Um, that's trends of this world and Satan's scheme so so that we could fix our eyes on just just visible reality, what we are going through right now, our realities, problems, conflicts, or what we have, what we don't have, um, what we have achieved, all the mistakes we made, those kind of stuff. Um, but we need to fix our eyes on God and His plan and His will for us and for this generation. Um, in order for us to uh, fight against the scheme of our enemy, Satan, and try to overcome these trends of this world, not uh, be able to uh, not be swayed by this in you know, a tr- trends or waves or stream of this world um, so that we could fix our eyes on God, we need to know how this world has become like this and the scheme of our enemy so that we could examine our, our, our way, our ways to perceive things and we can fight against our enemy. Um, there are two um, big pillars uh, throughout the history 
seed of serpent and seed of woman. These two. Throughout the history, you could see these uh, two different group of people were streams, were, we could say the kingdoms. Um, we see constant contrast again between these two seas in the world. If we get to know um, this spiritual reality, uh, then we could get to know how we fight against the schemes of our enemy and how can we uh, become strong enough to um, fight against trends or waves this world. In our text, uh, we could see the seed of the serpent, the Cain and Cain's um, descendants. As you know, you know what happened in between Cain and Abel, right? Uh, Cain brought uh, his offering, um, the fruits of the soil um, that he harvested uh, to God. And Abel brought um, the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions, if you look at verse 3 and 4. And God received uh, Abel's offering, not Cain's. And Cain's got upset. And he was so mad. And then uh, he took his brother to the field and he killed his brother Abel. Many scholars are saying that, are kind of assuming that, that was the first case of homicide. So Cain had no idea how to kill a person. So he... Um, uh, killed Abel, you know, with the rock, you know, hitting him from the um, top to the bottom. Um, it's um, it's tragic, right? Um, but you know why God didn't accept Cain's offering, but Abel's offering. If you look at Hebrews chapter eleven, verse four. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gift, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. So Cain He was going against God's um, will. If you look at uh, previous narrative, you know Adam and Eve committed sin before God, and they were kicked out of um, the Garden of Eden, and they moved to east of Eden. And then, um, as soon as they find out they were naked and they were shameful, God slaughtered an animal, an animal, and then made a, um, the cloth to cover their shamefulness. Um, that's how they cover their shamefulness and how they, you know, dealt with their sins, the constant blood sacrifice. So even though Cain was told what happened to his um, parents and how God dealt with their sins, and how they, you know, offer sacrifice. But he pursued his own ways and desire. As soon as his way got rejected, he killed his own brother, Abel, out of anger. You could see that um, God was trying to give Cain, every opportunity uh, for him to repent. Um, but I couldn't see a heart of repentance in Cain. 
He was sorry for the consequence of sin. He was kind of, uh, kind of afraid, or he was anxious about the consequence of sin. But he was not sorry for uh, the sin he committed. It's really self-centered. That's the sinful thoughts, sinful attitudes, sinful minds. So if you look at verse 12, God cursed him. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. And you're going to become a restless wanderer on the earth. Uh, I think that's the worst curse ever. Um, You're going to become restless uh, wanderer uh, on the earth. So there's no one to go to. There's no place to rest, anxious, uh, fearful, wherever he goes. If you get that kind of curse, uh, I'm not sure, but for me, I will, like, you know, ask for forgiveness. So I'm so sorry about, you know, what I've done. Can you forgive me? Like I said, I couldn't see a heart of repentance in Cain. If you look at verse 12, today's text, he went away from the presence of God. He went away from the presence of God. Instead of asking for forgiveness, he went away from God. And he settled in the land of Nod. Interesting, Nod meaning wandering. So he wandered in the land of wanderings and east of Eden. So Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden and they moved to east of Eden. And then they went further than that, farther than that, east of Eden. So um, farther from the Garden of Eden, God's protection, God's guidance, uh, God's sovereignty. You know, Cain was trying to go against God's will. So he went away from the presence of the Lord, the east of Eden, and he settled in the land of Nod, wandering. Since God is omnipresent, He's everywhere, right? So it is impossible to go away from God, but it talks about the Cain's spiritual state. That's the spiritual state of mankind after the fall. Whether they notice or not, they really mean it or not, they're going against God's will. All the ways, all the thoughts, all the minds that they have. Those who have Christian background but turn away from it tend to live a worse life than mere non-believers. Trying to prove that uh, they are right and God was wrong. Hitler. Um, he had a Christian background. You know the Madeleine Manson? Uh, Antichrist superstar, then he, he uh, wrote those kind of s- songs. And he's really uh, crazy rock, um, uh, what do you call, heavy metal you know, singers. Um, give me a song, North Korean. Um, he had a Christian background. They turn away from God, uh, and then they tend to live a worse life than mere non-believers and they try to prove themselves they were right, and God was wrong. Um, We could see that in uh, the life of Cain. This is the trend, how these trends of the world um, created and developed. And Cain built the city. Um, this is the first record uh, in the Bible. 
using the word city. He became wonder on the earth, restless wonder, and then he tried to find his own way of protecting himself and building up their his own uh, security system and protection system. That's the city. And then he called it after the name of his son, Enoch. The name Enoch means to initiate or uh, to forge. That refers to the one who is initiator or the forger. Um, this seems to uh, in- indicate an attempt on Cain's part at a new beginning. So apart from God's uh, protection, apart from God's protect, uh, guidance and uh, sovereignty, and he tried to begin a new beginning on his own method and ways. That's what it means. And he called that city, name of the city, after his own son, not after God. Same thing with the New Age movement. We used to believe in God. We used to think that we have absolute truth. So we have now have new age. What is that? Apart from God, we need to get rid of God. You are God. You could protect yourself. You could build up your own security system. I, self, self-centered. trying to replace the Garden of Eden. Basically, replacing God uh, by building a city of his own. Same thing with the Tower of Babel. Uh, You know, God judged uh, the whole world, you know, human race with the flood. And they try to... uh, go against God's will, and they try to protect them th- themselves by building the Tower of B- Babel. Same thing. It goes on and on. That's the trends of this world. And these trends will make us to fix our eyes on only visible reality. They try to get rid of God, just like replacing God with something, the city. And they try to satisfy it with their own ways. That's the culture. So if you build a city, then uh, individuals are gathering together and they create their own culture, right? Tim Keller said, sin doesn't just ruin the individual life, it ruins the culture. It doesn't just ruin our individual life, little lives. It ruins human society and culture. And he asked the question, what is the culture? Tim Keller said, culture making is this. You take the stuff, the raw material of the world, and you produce things for human life and flourishing. So when you take the raw material of sound and human experience, and you produce music and narrative, that's the art. When you take the raw material of the physical world, you produce technology and the sciences. I totally agree with that. That's a that's culture. You take the raw material that God has created, and you produce something for your own life. That's the culture. What's the culture that they made? Um, Lamech, you could see the Lamech, right? Um, if you look at verse um, 18 and 19, um, Cain's um, son, 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 and then six generations passed, and then Lamech came. And Lamech, that's the first um, description of his life. Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Adah, 
and the name of the other Jilla. This is the first record of polygamy in the Bible. Polygamy is not uh, the will of God and plan of God. That's not the design of God. Not at all. Robert Arthur, the great Jewish expert on biblical literature, says, If you know how to read the book of Genesis, you will know that one of the main subtexts of the book of Genesis, if you read all through the stories from here down through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, etc., one of the main subtexts and therefore one of the main points of the book of Genesis is polygamy is an absolute disaster. You know the story of Abraham? He took his uh, two wives. Uh, you know the descendants of uh, their sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Still we have uh, great conflict in between those two uh, descendants. Polygamy is absolute disaster. So Lamech produced what? This culture, polygamy. And his sons, three sons, uh, they are great individuals if you look at them. Ju uh, Jabal, um, the father of those who live in the tent and raise livestock. Kind of settle down culture, like social system. He was able to uh, live in the tent, like in a house, and raise livestock. And his another son, Jubal, the father of all those who play lyre, string instruments, and pipes. So we have ancestor of culture of music, Jubal. And another son, Tubacane, the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. Even from that time on, we could see the age of iron. He was the metal worker. Like he was making some instruments or weapons uh, of iron. Nothing wrong with those uh, culture, except this polygamy. But you could see how the culture it came from. That's the, this city, ruined city, or distorted city and sinful city produced the culture of death. The city built by Cain produced the culture of death. If you see, if you see, if you look at the um, Lamech's speech, like a poem, the first poem recorded in the Bible in human history, his speech to his two wives. And he said, I have killed a man for wounding me. First of all, the word wound or injured is the word for bruise, just scratch. And he said, young man for striking me, so injured me, injuring me. The young man actually best translate lad, which is boy. That's the culture of uh, death. If you scratch me or bruise me, even though you are a little young boy, I'll kill you out of anger and Kind of later on, you could see he is pride for heart, too. I've seen a lot of um, kind of uh, cruel crimes committed by parents or young generation as well. Um, a month ago, I heard that um, there was a stepmother who... Try to put, you know, punish or discipline um, his stepson, her stepson, 
by putting him in the suitcase. And uh, that boy was a nine-year-old boy. He was able to speak and everything, right? Um, but he was there, and he couldn't even speak, like, and tell his stepmother that I need to go to the bathroom. He's peon uh, in there. And his uh, stepmother got mad, and he, her, she took him out and then you know, put him in a kind of smaller suitcase. And then he, uh, she uh, went outside, and I don't know what she did, but after she came back, um, um, that son was dead. Um, those cruel crimes. If you kind of scratch me, if you hurt me, if you bruise me, even though you're a young man, I'll kill you. And he was kind of boasting about his crime, his sin. And that's the culture that um, came out of the city built by Cain. And he continued to say, if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is 77-fold. Do you know what that means? Uh, if you look at verse 15, God promised Cain. Cain was kind of afraid of uh, being killed by uh, people because he killed his own brother, Abel, right? But God promised to him that if anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. So that was God's promise on, you know, on behalf of Cain, Right? Lamech is saying that he's way better than God. If God provides sevenfold vengeance for Cain, then I will provide 77-fold. Like 77, like, you know, the number uh, refers to perfection. I'm going to provide that, you know, revenge, perfect revenge for myself, 77-fold. I am way better than God. It's really... Um, prideful, arrogant heart. So, in this culture, there is no God. God was not present there. They forget about God, or they abandon God. Um, at least, Cain tried to offer a sacrifice to God, but Lamech, after uh, six generations passed, Lamech you know, he didn't even mention about God at all. I think that's the history of America. In the beginning, Puritan tries try to keep their faith in God, and they stake their lives to move to this um, new um, land. But now, people are going against God. They are building their own security, their own city, and producing the culture of death. You know what? After Lamech's age, the age of Nephilim came, as you know. This culture, music, technology, and you know, social system, um, that's out of God's common grace. But they are trying to use God's common grace to come up with their own way of protection and security, not bringing the glory of God. So that's the trends of this world. It seems like, you know, really excellent. Like they are the father of all who play liar and uh, pipes. You know, they were called the father the father of those who live in the tent and raise livestock, and forger, initiator, right, of all instruments of bronze and iron. It's really fancy and excellent, but try to make us to fix our eyes on this visible reality. How fancy it is, how beautiful it is. Later on, if you look at Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God, See the woman, sons of God, saw the attraction of 
daughters of the world, man, seed of serpent, and they got married. That's how beautiful it is. It's Satan's scheme is make us to fix our eyes on this visible reality and try to follow that streams and look down on the ordinary life. The reason why I brought this up is because we need to be aware of what's going on. How this world has be- be- begun. Other than that, we're not going to know the scheme of our enemy, Satan. Then how can we fight against these streams, waves, and trends of this world? I was, I was expecting like, you know, kind of extraordinary, excellent way of um, kind of fighting against this stream of world. But it's really simple um, if you look at last two verses of this chapter. And eight, Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For, his, for she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth, also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At the time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Seth and his descendants. Um, Abel's death might seem like unfair, really unfair. Even though he worshipped God in the right way, but he became the first martyr of history. God has given another seed, Abel, Seth. Uh, God's, you know, uh, if you look at how Eve responded to um, this, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. Um, this seed of woman, their traits is in threefold. First, They were holding on to God's promise. God kept his promise by giving Seth to Adam. Think about it. They committed sin. They were kicked out of Garden of Eden. But God promised offspring of woman. I'm going to send the Messiah, Redeemer, through your seed. And Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel, but Cain killed Abel. The Cain became the first homicide, the main figure of homicide, right? So it seems like, you know, hopeless and hapless, but God kept his promise by giving another offspring named Seth. That's how God keep his promise. That's how God Fulfill his promise instead of doing something or instead of bringing way better or way more fancier um, technology or culture. If you look at um, how Eve responded to her bearing her children. First, when she had Cain, verse 1. Now Adam knew why Eve, his wife, And she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Of course, she remembered God, right? She remembered the promise of God. But I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. But if you look at verse 25, when she had said, it says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me 
another offspring instead of Abel. Instead of, I have gotten a man, um, a man with the help of the Lord, but she said in verse 25, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel. Her faith in God, her acknowledgement of God's uh, sovereignty uh, got um, better. God is the one who keeps his promise, his covenant, uh, faithfully. So we need to hold on to this uh, God's promise, his way of fulfilling his promises. Acknowledging the weaknesses of man. Seth had a, uh, his child, his son. He, he named his son Enosh. That means frail one. Enosh, frail one, or mortal. Instead of boasting about his strength like Lamech did, Seth acknowledged his weaknesses by naming his son frail one, Enosh. So, seed of woman, instead of focusing on us, our ability, our potential, um, our background, our achievement, we need to acknowledge the weaknesses of man, frail one. Even though the strength of this world is trying to make us fix our eyes on the visible reality, including ourselves, like what we have, what we don't have, what we have achieved, or what we couldn't even do anything, like mistakes, our inabilities, weaknesses. Seth acknowledged the weaknesses of man. So we're not going to fix our eyes on us, but God, holding on to God's promise. If you look at verse 26, to Seth, also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord. We have the first disclosure of the divine name Lord in the scripture. We pronounce Jehovah or Yahweh. Um, that's the covenant name of the Lord. So when he, when God made His covenant with His people, He called Himself the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah. And this is the first time um, this word, the covenant name of the Lord, was used. So we could see. They were holding on to you, the promise, the covenant of God. Calling upon the name of the Lord means the people gathered together for public, communal, corporate worship. Because this phrase, to call upon the name of the Lord, is very usually used in the Old Testament to refer to corporate worship. So we have the first public, communal, uh, corporate worship of the Lord recorded in human history. People began to gather communally to worship the Lord God cooperatively together. Um, instead of trying to build their own 
like a city or a better city, they call upon the name of the Lord. It seems like really ordinary, nothing special, nothing extraordinary, but that's how God fulfilled His promises. That's how God disciplined His people to carry out His calling and mission. We see the progress of technology in the line of Cain. And we see the progress of worship of God in the line of Seth. That's the really important distinction between this seed of serpent and seed of woman. We see the progress of corporate worship of the Lord in the line of Seth. You know, Jesus Christ came from the line of Seth. So what we need to do is we need to really restore this corporate worship. We could see the progress of this culture, the culture of death. How can we fight against this? How can we fight against the scheme of Satan holding on to God's promise and acknowledge how weak we are? And that's why we call upon the name of the Lord. We gather together for corporate worship to acknowledge who God is. The only ray of hope in this chapter comes from God, not his own people. None of God's people make significant contribution to it. No, not at all. It's not about what we do. Seth didn't do anything. He just called upon the name of the Lord. They gathered together to worship God. That's the ray of hope. And they establish holiness and they bear a godly line. So we need to note here again, it is not our plan of hope that brings rescue to the wicked world. It is God's plan which brings hope for redemption in the world. That's why I emphasize on the ordinary, power of the ordinary. It doesn't seem like extraordinary, excellent, or special. We just hold on to God's word, God's promises. Is that how we can conquer this seed of serpent? Sure. That's God's way. Or just acknowledge how weak we are? Yeah, that's why we're going to kneel down before God. The Wednesday, we gather together for prayer. Why? Because we know, we admit how weak we are. We acknowledge how weak we are. We are afraid of one. That's what we gather together for this corporate worship. We need to worship God. We need to get strengthened by God. And we need to remember His promise and His you know, covenant and His faithful one. Let's pray. Let's pray, Lord, open our eyes, so spiritual eyes to see what's going on in this world. You know, you could see this um, line of Cain, and you could see line of Seth. It's really totally different. Um, I was reading a book, and then I was thinking about this and meditating upon this. Uh, passage and yeah right I made a conclusion this is what I need to do I need to really encourage our Sela to really keep up with this three things holding on to God's promise and acknowledge the weakness of man so that we could call upon the name of the Lord we could gather together for corporate worship we need to stand as a worshiper that's it. In our ordinary life, even though you are quarantined at your home, we need to gather together uh, in our spirit. We need to worship God. We need to really remember who God is. Let's pray together.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this message once again. Um, oftentimes we find ourselves uh, to envy what's going on in this world, the attractions of this world, fanciness of this world. We try to have and we try to earn what the world offers. Um, Lord, we really pray that would you really pour your grace and mercy and your wisdom and your strength upon us so that we could really see how you save this world and age and generation. Um, like, you know, line of Seth, um, those are the ones who held on to your promises, your covenant faithfully. And they are the ones who acknowledge their weaknesses. They are the ones who call upon the, your name. And they gather together for worship. Lord, all of Selah wants to really uh, be a part of the seed of women. Um, we want to really um, carry out the calling and the commission uh, that you have given us by gathering together for corporate worship. We thank you for what you have uh, spoken to us and uh, for your love. We thank you. We love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We're going to receive God's blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, amazing, unfailing, unending love of God the Father, feeling, protection, guidance, empowerment of the Holy Spirit will be upon it. all the heads of your cellar, your people, your children, the seed of women who desire to keep up with these three things, holding on to your promises, acknowledging the weaknesses of men, and calling upon the name of the Lord, be upon um, cellar ministry and all the cellar uh, members, whatever they are, what kind of situation they are in, and um, upon this country and this generation, be both now and forevermore. Amen.